In science, there are no sacred truths. All assumptions must be critically examined. Arguments from authority are worthless. Whatever is inconsistent with facts must be discarded or revised. We must understand the cosmos as it is and not to confuse how it is with how we wish it to be. The obvious is sometimes false. The unexpected sometimes true. Carl Sagan, Cosmos. Episode 13, Who Speaks for Earth? If Velikovsky's celestial hypothesis is correct, it must not only correlate with historical evidence, but must also correlate with and be corroborated by scientific evidence. His thesis requires that there should exist unambiguous scientific evidence that celestial mechanics accepted by all scientists as being perfect as possible is in error. If that can be proved to be the case, that cosmological theory for the stability of the solar system and the evolution of the universe, birth and evolution of galaxies, as well as stars, must also be in error. The need for such a book that gathers the evidence for celestial mechanics, the cosmology of the universe, and especially the evolution of the solar system in recent times that Velikovsky presented is long overdue. Although I intend to present a great deal of new evidence regarding these matters, it is unavoidable that I will have to present materials already published in order to elucidate the problems. Possible solutions the faced Velikovsky unstable solar system hypothesis and possible solutions that face Velikovsky's unstable solar system hypothesis. In this respect, one must not only deal with the question of planetary orbital changes, but also of these changes in terms of their chronology and recent history into which these chaotic motions must be proved to fit. Hence, much of this book will examine not only the evidence for the very recent unstable orbits of Mars and Venus, but it must examine the chronological scientific evidence that conforms with Velikovsky's time scale as well. Both the evidence for the solar system instability and to the return to stability for the chronological framework that Velikovsky presented must agree if his theory is valid. More than that, these varied forms of scientific evidence must contradict the scientific establishment's hypothesis on the very same points. Much of this book will therefore deal with various forms of scientific evidence that contradicts the chronology of a stable solar system over, say, 20 million years. For those who have read Pillars of the Past, Volumes 1, 2, 3, and 4, will remember I employed several forms of scientific evidence to analyze the chronology of the ancient world. In this respect, my approach to the established astronomical chronology of the solar system, like that of the ancient historical established chronology, will be based on presenting a great number of different forms of interdisciplinary scientific evidence that correlate and corroborate one another, but are also fully congruent with Velikovsky's hypothesis and are clearly contradictory to or highly problematic for the thesis that the solar system has been stable in recent times. In the next part of this book, Velikovsky's concept of the important role electromagnetism plays in celestial mechanics will be examined, as well as its application to solar system stability and also to cosmology. Thus, in a sense, this volume is a continuation of my book, The Electrogravitic Theory of Celestial Motion and Cosmology. As we will see in the next chapters, the astrophysicists, astronomers, and cosmologists have literally outdone Aristotle and the Greek astronomers. Inventions of epicycles by creating new forms of matter new celestial mechanical forces, and even new dimensions of space. It has actually reached the point for where many scientists are now saying the entire cosmological edifice upheld by these new forms of matter, energy, 
multiple dimensions is a colossally false rendering of celestial reality. What has always been the problem for Velikovsky and his followers is the important role mathematics has played in all this. Up until now, we have assumed that Newtonian Einsteinian theory is as perfect as can be and perfectly reflects the forces governing the motions of celestial bodies. It will be shown that mathematics has played with a leading part in driving the entire scientific community regarding these matters of celestial mechanics blindly into error. This will be examined toward the end of the book that too great a reliance and belief in the absolute validity only of mathematics to explain the universe is not just a modern cosmological blunder, but a repetition of these same blunders of the ancient past like the Aristotelian geocentric theory. Between what has been assumed to be objective scientific truth, the method and human psychology and sociology interrelate and as these were understood by Velikovsky and others, it must be noted that those who attempt to criticize this book but ignore or who have failed to read the electrogravitic theory of celestial motion and cosmology are not dealing honestly with the materials presented here. The celestial mechanics presented in the, in the earlier work will be greatly enlarged in this. Therefore, failure to understand that earlier evidence or deal with it as it relates to the foregoing evidence means that the critic is either ignorant of what scholarship requires or is determined to discredit this book's evidence without knowing it or even allowing their readers to know it. What I conceive to be Velikovsky's greatest problem and misfortune is that his ideas are so far ahead of his time that he had to be pilloried because the great paradigms and scientists whose concepts he challenged were false idols of his age, and it is inconceivable to the scientists, academics, and mass media that their idols could be wrong. Newton, Einstein, and all their theories, and those that had been derived from them were the scientific idols of the 20th century, to whom all bowed as having established the indisputable laws that govern reality. This book is addressed to dealing with these giants and their theories. Because this theory is largely derived from Velikovsky, who maintained that the planets in close contact could be cushioned by their repelling magnetic fields, I have maintained that these fields must weaken at greater distances, but are still operating in a repelling manner. Therefore, since this book is a defense of my own theory and indirectly of Velikovsky's celestial scenario, I take full responsibility for it. Velikovsky could not have known what would be developed and or derived from his recent unstable solar system theory and cannot therefore be held responsible for what I produced. No more could Velikovsky be held responsible for the creationists that followed him. Nevertheless, this connection has been employed by Michael D. Gordon in his book, the Pseudoscience Wars, Manuel Velikovsky and the Birth of the Modern Fringe. It is a simple guilt by association critique of Velikovsky and in no way proves anything about Velikovsky because it fails to examine Velikovsky's thesis, but only his connection with later other groups. As Tom Van Flandren tells us, the validity of an idea can be determined solely by an examination of its merits. This examination Gordon has not done, and thus his critique is shallow and beside the point. Electromagnetism and Celestial Motion Robert Millikan was asked whether he knew of anyone who had ever found a way of modifying or influencing the force of gravity. Millikan is said to have replied, briskly, of course not. Such a thing is impossible and out of the question. Robert Millikan, 
and Paul A. Lavalette, Secrets of Anti-Gravity Propulsion, Rochester, 2008. Velikovsky challenged the concept that only gravity affected celestial motions when he wrote unambiguously, the accepted celestial mechanics notwithstanding the many calculations that have been carried out to many decimal places or verified by celestial motions stands only if the sun, the source of light, warmth, and other radiation, is as a whole an electrically neutral body. Fundamental principles of celestial mechanics, including the law of gravitation, must come into question if the sun possesses a charge sufficient to influence the planets in their orbits or the comets in theirs. In the Newtonian celestial mechanics, based on the theory of gravitation, electricity and magnetism play no role. He further held that gravitation as an electromagnetic phenomenon. In that citation, Len E. Rose pointed out that Velikovsky had moved away from some of these positions. It should be noted that during the last two decades or so of Velikovsky's life, the ideas that had been expressed in Cosmos Without Gravitation, Four Plans of the Universe, no longer reflected Velikovsky's approach to the extent that they once did. In particular, he backed off considerably from the idea of circumduction as a non-gravitational, non-inertial account, sufficient in itself to explain orbital motions. He also backed off from any general suggestions that gravity and inertia might somehow be banned from the celestial arena. And well, he, he took such a pounding over it. What he often said in his later years was, not that gravity and inertia played no role, but rather that they did not play the only role. That is, that gravity and inertia were not alone responsible for what occurred in the celestial arena. Electromagnetic interactions also played a considerable role in cosmic events, especially when celestial bodies were in close approach to each other, but also even when they were far apart. In any case, each of the four plans of the universe even the fourth, should be taken as a construction, a working hypothesis, for the purposes of discussion. Not as a final position, the same is true of cosmos without gravitation. Not all of the ideas that were formulated in that early monograph were ones that Velikovsky continued to adhere to in his later work. Nevertheless, it must be emphasized that Velikovsky did not ever abandon the idea that gravity itself might eventually be interpreted as an electromagnetic phenomenon, nor did he ever abandon the idea that the solar magnetic field might, to some extent, be responsible for the fact that the planetary orbits are roughly coplanar. This, then, is the general concept that Velikovsky believed celestial mechanics rested upon. Nevertheless, before proceeding, it must be pointed out that Robert J. Shadwald on the advice of one of Velikovsky's disgruntled followers, brought up Cosmos Without Collision and cited it without ever letting his readers know that Velikovsky no longer agreed with much of that material, but clearly and anger-driven claimed these were still Velikovsky's positions. Nevertheless, Velikovsky's electromagnetic concept is now out in the scientific community and, as we will see, it is growing. As was also pointed out above, in the chapter on celestial mechanics, there are several aspects of celestial mechanics that cannot be correlated mathematically without Newtonian theory, but require an additional force, electromagnetic force, in order to operate. Miles Mathis, who well understood the depths of maniacal rage this Velikovskian concept held for his critics, pointly states, astrophysics, who would have to admit that Velikovsky was at least partially right, would rather tear out their eyeballs and eat them than go there. In terms of Freudian psychology, the great underlying neurotic problem of, of humanity is the eatable complex, as outlined by the Greek playwright Sophocles in his trilogy Oedipus. Oedipus, unable to deal with the fact that he had violated every moral aspect in his life when discovering that he had actually done so, gouged out his eyeballs, unable to face his behavior. So, too, the scientists of this generation, according to Mathis, rather than admit Velikovsky was at least partially right, would rather tear out their eyeballs. Velikovsky was related. <laughs> I'm just picturing that. Velikovsky has related a story he liked to tell. Once in the twilight hour, a visitor came to my study, a distinguished-looking gentleman. 
He brought me a manuscript dealing with celestial mechanics. After a glance at some of the pages, I had the feeling that this was the work of a mathematical genius. I entered into a conversation with my visitor and mentioned the name of James Clerk Maxwell. My guest asked, who is he? Embarrassed, I answered, you know the scientist who gave a theoretical explanation of the experiments of Faraday? And who is Faraday? inquired the stranger. In growing embarrassment, I said, of course, the man who did pioneer work in electromagnetism. And what is electromagnetism? asked the gentleman. What is your name? I inquired. He answered, Isaac Newton. When Velikovsky awoke on his knees was an open volume of Newton's Principia. This story is told to illustrate what I have said before. Would you listen to anybody discuss the mechanics of the spheres who does not know the elementary physical forces existing in nature? But this is the position adopted by astronomers who acclaim as infallible a celestial mechanics conceived in the 1660s in which electricity and magnetism play not the slightest role. Let us first examine the reaction of the astronomers to evidence that electromagnetism plays in celestial mechanics before looking at the experimental evidence related to it. This brings us the first part of the Velikovsky affair. When critics of Velikovsky's concept that electromagnetism plays a crucial role in celestial mechanics was debated and forcefully denied. What we will see is that in each and every instance when a critic leveled a charge against Velikovsky's electromagnetic concept and it was shown to be an error and further the evidence instead supported Velikovsky. The critic never faced up to that counter evidence and acted as if the counter evidence never existed by retreating into a state of silence and denial. Let us now look at these early critics and the evidence. The first critic was Donald Menzel, director of Harvard College Observatory, as explained by Ralph E. Jurgens. In 1952, in the proceedings of the American Philosophical Society, Menzel had offered calculations to show that if Velikovsky were right about the electromagnetic forces in the solar system, the sun would have a surface electric potential of 10 to the 19th, 10 billion billion volts. An absolute impossibility, according to the astronomers. But in 1960, V.A. Bailey, emeritus professor of physics at the University of Sydney, claimed that the sun is electrically charged and that it had a surface potential of 10 to the 19th volts precisely the value calculated by Menzel. Bailey at the time, his theory was first published, was entirely unaware of Velikovsky's work and of Menzel's refutation of it. The idea that this quantitative refutation of Velikovsky's wild hypothesis, Menzel's own description of his contribution to the proceedings in 1952, should now be brought to Velikovsky's support, was intolerable to the Harvard astronomer so when he mailed his paper to Harper's in 1963, he also sent a copy to Bailey in Sydney and asked him in a covering letter to revoke his theory of electric charge of the sun. The theory was casting doubt on the continuing efforts of Menzel and other American scientists to discredit Velikovsky, and Menzel pointed out of what he conceived to be an error in Bailey's work. The mathematical error, to the contrary, had been made by Menzel. Nevertheless, when new scientific evidence supported Velikovsky's concept regarding electromagnetism, neither Menzel nor the rest of the astronomical physics establishment jumped at the opportunity of evaluating how it might operate, but instead tried to deny the evidence existed. Einstein agreed with Velikovsky, who said, The real cause of indignation against my theory of global catastrophes is the implication that celestial bodies may be charged. He, Einstein, wrote, in the margin, ja, yes, just like the scholastic professors denied that Galileo's telescope showed Jupiter had four moons circling it. The entire scientific establishment denied that the sun may very well carry a charge capable of affecting the orbits of the planets. There was no investigation, only flat-out denial. 